we'll start off by looking at the two formulae we get given. This one over here is for the average of some numbers, what we call the mean. And really what it says, it says just add them up uh, and divide by how many there are. We'll talk now a little bit later about the F is the frequency, the number of times that data item occurs times the actual data item. Um, and just you just add up all the data items and divide by how many there are. And then this formula here gives us our variance, uh, which is the square of standard deviation, but we'll, we'll talk about that in quite a bit more detail just now. So just to start off with some terminology and you need to learn this stuff. First up, the mode is the most commonly occurring data item. Sometimes there might be two that occur the same number, then you list them both. The mean we've spoken about already, it's the numerical average. And the symbol for the mean is X with a little bar over the top of it. The second quartile, Q2, is called the median, and that's the middle data item in a ranked list. So all of these ones are what we call measures of central tendency. That's not all that important. And then we have sort of a few measures of, of spread, range, how much, how much, how spread out the data is. So range is the biggest minus the smallest. Uh, ranked data is data which is sorted. The first quartile is the Q1 is the data item which occurs one quarter of the way through ranked data. The third quartile is the data item which occurs three quarters of the way through ranked data. And then the variance and the standard deviation are a measure of the spread of the data. And I'll talk about that in more detail. Just remember that the variance is the square of the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Okay, let's remind ourselves about this idea of a five number summary. And what we do is we take the number of terms we've got and we add one and we divide by four. And that gives us the positions for our quartiles. So for example, over here, we've got 27 numbers. I think I'm right in saying. I'm just going to count them to check. Indeed, 27 numbers. So 27 plus one gives us 28 over four. That means that the first quartile will be in the seventh position. The median, or quartile two, will be in the 14th. So we take that seven and double it, in the 14th position. And the third quartile, we take the seven and, and multiply it by three, and we get the 21st position. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 15 will be our first quartile. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 46 will be our second quartile or our median. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. 66 will be our third quartile. Right, so if we then look at what we, so the five number summary is the smallest number, which is one, followed by the three quartiles in order, 15, 46, 66 followed by the last the largest number which is 90. so this this over here is what we call our five number summary and it's those numbers that we use to draw a box and whisker plot so there's one there's 15 15 the first quartile is the bottom edge of the box the left hand edge of the box 46 is the median so this is q1 this is the minimum this is q2 Q3, which is 66, and then the maximum value, which is 90. Now, two measures of spread that are quite important are what we call the range and the interquartile range. So the range is just the biggest minus the smallest. So the range would be 90 minus one or 89. The interquartile range is the third quartile minus the four, first quartile, so 66 minus 15. So the interquartile range would be 51. One of the things that we need to be able to do is establish whether data is symmetrical or skewed left or right. So there's, a, there's, a, there's two bits of terminology that we use for, for left and right skewed. Right skewed, we, we talk about the data being positively skewed. and left skewed, we talk about the data being negatively skewed. So there are two pictures for each of these. 
The, the bottom ones are the box and whisker plots that we've just spoken about. And basically what happens is that the median will be kind of in the middle of the box for, for symmetrical data. And one would expect the whiskers to be of similar lengths. With positively skewed data, the data to the, to the right above the median, in other words, bigger than the median, is more spread out than the data to the left. It's not that there's more data, it's just that it's more spread out. Obviously, there's exactly the same number of amount, the same number of data items that are bigger than the median as they are smaller than the median. But the, the ones that, to the, that are bigger than the median are more spread out. We say that the data is positively skewed. And notice how the, histi the corresponding kind of histogram looks. Uh, so it's actually sort of across to the left, uh, there's a bump across to the left as opposed to a bump across to the right. So it's really important that one's able to identify where the data is positively or negatively skewed. Basically, if it's positively skewed the, or skewed right, then there's more data, the, the, the spread of data is, is bigger to the right of the median and vice versa for negatively skewed. Okay, one of the things that, that sometimes gets asked is testing whether an item is an outlier. Now, there's a few different definitions of this, but one of the common ones, uh, so they'll either, they'll either give you this one or they might expect you to know this one, but a data item is considered an outlier if it exceeds the third quartile by more than one and a half times the interquartile range, or if it is less than the first quartile by that amount. So for example, suppose Q1 is 40 and Q3 is 50. Then the interquartile range is 10, and one and a half times the interquartile range would obviously be 15. So anything that's 40 minus 15 is 25. Anything less than 25 would be considered an outlier here, or anything that is bigger than 15 above Q3, in other words, bigger than 65. Those would be considered outliers. Sometimes they would be uh, excluded from, from the data set because they, they're considered sort of uh, freakish or, or anomalies. Right, one of the things that we need to be good at is calculating standard deviation. And there are two ways of doing it. One is, is understanding how the formula works. And the second is, is using a calculator. And I'm going to show you both. And I'm going to show you why you need to know both. All right. So if you look at this formula, this formula gives us variance. And what it says, it says basically for every item, we take away the mean, we square the result, we add all of them up, and then we divide by how many there are. So we basically find an average of the, the difference between the mean and every data item squared we add those up and, and divide it out so we get an average. Right, and that gives us the variance. So the first thing in calculating standard deviation, we would need to find the mean. So for example, if I had these four numbers here, two and five is seven, and seven is 14, 24, the mean is gonna be 24 divided by four or six. Right, then what I do is I take each data item and I work out what is that data item, two minus the mean, five minus the mean seven minus the mean and 10 minus the mean All right those obviously come to negative four negative one one and four now interestingly if one averaged those out at the moment we'd get zero because the positive ones and the negative ones would kind of cancel each other out that is why we do a squaring over here so we now square each of these numbers so we get 16 one one and 16 we add them up and we get 34, and then we divide by how many there are. So 34 divided by four. Right now 34 over four, I think is 8.5. And that is our variance, right? So the standard deviation would be the square root of 8.5. Right, let's, let's have a look at how we would check this out on a calculator. Right, so we go mode, stat, and we're going for one variable stats. You'll notice I've got the frequency mode turned on on my calculator. That's a good idea, and I'll show you how to turn that on just now. All right, but we're going to put in our data items, 2, 5, 7, and 10. We then press all clear, and we go shift, stat, and we're going for var, which are the variables about those data items. The calculator gives us three options that we're going to use. The first one is N, how many data items there are. 
The second one is X bar, that's the mean, which we've already worked out to be six, so we won't bother to confirm that. And the third one is the standard deviation, and we always use this one as opposed to this one, which is also a standard deviation, but for a different application. So we use number three, right? And we get 2,914. Now, if I, so that's the standard deviation, and I'm hoping that that's the square root of 8.5. If I square that result, we see that I get 8.5. So it is in fact indeed correct. So a lot of people will say, well, why on earth would one bother to, to calculate standard deviation this long way if one's calculator can do it? And examiners try to make up questions that make sure you actually understand what's going on with standard deviation. So let's have a look at, it, at two examples that I've made up. Right. So here's an example. We're not given the raw data. John calculates the standard deviation of five numbers to be the square root of 44. And he finds a scrap of paper from his calculation. And the question is, what number was here if these numbers, which we, we don't actually know the, the original data, had a standard deviation of the square root of 44, and there were five of them. So now remember, if the standard deviation is root 44, then obviously the variance, which is what the formula would get on the data sheet, the variance will be 44, right? Now there are five numbers, that means that the sum of the squares, in other words, this of our numbers must have been, sorry, of our numbers minus the mean or squared, that must have been 220. Because once we divide it by 5, we get 44. So these here have to add up to 220, right? And so that enables me to work out A. And so I've got, I've got 89, I think, 89, 90. All right, so I think I've got 211 over here, I think. And I hope I'm right, in which case A must be 9. Okay, so that is correct. And the only way that we can do this question is, in fact, understanding the, the principle. Let's have a look at a, an even maybe a slightly higher order level one. So here are the maths marks for a class of 23 boys and they have a mean of 73% and a standard deviation of 10. Daniel's mark of 67% and Tim's mark of 79% are removed. What will the new standard deviation be? Now this is, this is quite a kind of a, one's got to think a little bit about this, but because obviously if marks are removed, the mean might change. But in fact, if one have a look at it, these two boys average out at the mean. Daniel's mark is actually 6% below the mean, and Tim's mark is 6% above the mean. So they're leaving, their marks being removed will not affect the mean. So the mean is still 73%, even, even when they're only 29, uh, 21 marks, all right? Now, what we knew is that there were, the standard deviation was 10, right? which means that the variance is 100, which means that when we add it up, all the numbers from 1 to 23, each one minus the mean, okay, we actually know that the mean is 23 squared, we would have got 2300. And the reason we need to get 2300 is that when we divide by 23, it being n, we get 100, and then when we square root it, we get our standard deviation of 10. Right, now, if we only take this up to, from 1 to 21, then what we've got, all right, we're going to get, we're going to get our 2300, but our, we now need to minus Daniel's mark minus the mean. And Tim's mark minus the mean. So Daniel's mark is 67 minus the mean is 73 and 79 minus 73. This one comes to 
negative six squared or 36 and this one comes to positive six squared so we need to take from 2300 we need to take 72 away and that leaves us with 2281 sorry it doesn't at all it leaves us with triple two eight all right triple two eight but that i now need to divide by 21 the new value of n so what in fact i get is i get that the, the new standard deviation is going to be triple two eight over 21 and that would be the variance so i then need to square root it and we work all of that out and we get about 10 comma 3. so the standard deviations increase slightly right let's take a look at interpreting standard deviation all that standard deviation is it's a measure of spread so for example here all three of these distributions of data the, the green the red and the purple have got uh, the same mean right these are sort of normal distributions they, they're, they're symmetrical about the mean right but in fact the green one has got a lower standard deviation right so for example if we call this one sigma one that one standard deviation sigma 2 and sigma 3 then sigma 1 is actually the smallest standard deviation the, the data is the most sort of uh, or the least spread away from the mean uh, sigma 2 the next smallest standard deviation and sigma 3 the biggest standard deviation the data is more spread out All right so as a general rule if one goes one standard deviation either side of the mean we include 67% of the data. If we have two standard deviations, we include 95% of the data. And if we go three standard deviations, we get include not just sort of just short of 100% of the data. These numbers are worth remembering. Okay, next we're going to talk about group data, right? So what I've got here is I've got some actual data, and what I've what I've done just to to illustrate the point is that I've I've actually there's the, there's the actual data right and we can actually work out for this actual data we can work out the if we type in these actual numbers we actually get a mean of 39,03 sometimes we're not given the actual data we just given the groups data so what we've got here is we've got a we've got the fact that nine people achieve marks between 20 and 30 out of 60 six people achieve marks between 30 and 40 seven people achieve marks between 40 and 50 and eight people achieve marks between 50 and 60. now we are asked to estimate the mean of this data right and what we do is we assume that these nine people who achieve marks between 20 and 30 we assume that they that they averaged out at the midpoint so in other words we, we say nine nine people got a mark of 25. Right? We could be quite far out in our, in our actual calculation, but, but as we'll see, it's actually not too bad a, 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 an estimate. Right? Likewise, these six people, we assume that they achieved on average the middle point of the interval. So we get all the midpoints of the intervals, and now we're going to go to our calculator, right? and we are going to, we're going to work these out. I just want to show you how to put your, your calculator into frequency mode because it's really useful to be able to do that. All right, so what one does, one goes shift mode, uh, down arrow, four, and then turn free, make sure that frequency is turned on. But right, now when I go into mode stat, and I'm still talking about one variable statistics here, so one, notice I've got a frequency button. So the midpoint was 25, the next midpoint was 35, the next midpoint was 45, and the last midpoint was 55. And now I go up and I put in the frequency. Nine people, six people, seven people, eight people, all right? I'm gonna press all clear, and I'm gonna go shift stat, and I'm gonna go five, sorry, four for variables. And first up, let's just check the number of data items. If I press one, you'll see that I, Okay, something's gone wrong here. Nine and six is fifteen. I should have got thirty data items. I've obviously made a problem, a mistake with the data. I'm going to go shift stat and actually look at the data that I put in. Yeah, indeed, I pressed an eight rather than a nine. Okay, so that was a useful 
it will check. Okay, so if I go shift stat four for the variables and I go one, I get 30 data items, which is what I was hoping for. Shift stat four. I can now also get the mean or the standard deviation, but those will be estimates. And the reason they're estimates is that we're not working with the original data, we're working with this assumption that they averaged the midpoints. So I'm gonna go with the mean now. And then we'll notice that I get an answer of 39.67 compared with the actual answer of 39.03. Right, so it's, this is an estimate as opposed to the actual answer. Right, here, just to, just to finish off on this, we see why, in fact, uh, well, we see how, this, how our formula is, is working here. So, so it's the frequency times the value, so 9 times 25 plus 6 times 35 plus 7 times 45, plus 8 times 55, all divided by n, and we get our answer. Okay, still working with, with group data. Sometimes we ask you what plot what's called a cumulative frequency curve. Just the important thing to remember here is that we start off, uh, so, so, so we've got our frequencies. In the column next door, we, we have what's called the cumulative frequency. So, for example, as uh, Nine is the cumulative frequency thus far, plus six gives us 15. This number of 15 means that 15 people got a mark of 40 or less. But the last number in our cumulative frequency column is the number of data items, the total number, okay? And that means that obviously 30 people got a mark of 60 or less. When we plot the cumulative frequency curve, we use the right-hand end of the, of the uh, interval and our cumulative frequency as the point to plot. So you'll notice we plot 30, 9, and then we plot 40, 15, 50, 22. Right, the normal shape, and I'm not drawing this, this one accurately, the normal shape of one of these, these cumulative frequency curves is a kind of elongated S. And what it does do is it always, the last point that we plot is always N. We always plot the, the sort of the marks, the weights, the heights, whatever they are on the horizontal axis and our cumulative frequency on the vertical axis. Right, so let's take a look now at a, an example of a cumulative frequency curve. And I actually want to do hide something there, so I'm going to just quickly change our uh, pause and we'll, we'll have a look at Okay, sorry about that. So we've got a we've got a cumulative frequency curve that's been drawn here. We've got marks on the on the horizontal axis, and we've got number of students on the vertical axis. So the first question here is, what is the interquartile range? Now we've got fifty students, so fifty divided by four is about twelve and a half, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in. At twelve and a half and at 47 and a half. So those are the positions of the quartile. Now we, we allow a little bit of uh, sort of leniency in terms of, in terms of exact accuracy here, right? But 12 and a half and 47 and a half. These numbers over here, this will be Q3 and this one will be Q1, right? The next question says, if a merit mark will go to the top 10%, now the top 10%, obviously out of 50 students, would be the, the, uh, from 45 to 50. So if we just have a look at them, all right, if we go from 45, we read off and we get a mark of about 83%. We normally are asked to show where we're gonna read off our answers. And then the last question, if 35% is a pass mark, what percentage of the students failed? So let's just have a look. 35%, now I'm looking over here at 35% and we see that we get about five, right? So just to answer these questions then, right? The interquartile range will be 73 minus 45, which is about 25. If a merit mark will go to the top 10%, remember the top 10% of the last five pupils, that the, uh, those there, uh, we read off about 83%. And then lastly, if 35% is the pass mark, what percentage of the students failed? Well, five out of 50, so about 10%. That's really important skills that you can read off these cumulative frequency curves. OK, 
Okay, so the last piece that we need to look at in, in the data handling is the idea of a line of best fit. And we're going to have a look at that now. Uh, so what we've got is we've got some data items. This line of best fit is also called a least squares regression line. Right, and so we've got X values and Y values. In this case, heights and weights. And we would expect heights and weights to be kind of, we'd expect some sort of a relationship to exist between them. Okay, so we, we've got a scatter plot over here, and we are able to work out the equation of the line of best fit. The only way we need to be able to do this is on a calculator, all right? And so let's just have a look at how that works. So very carefully put in our data. Now go for a stat, but for the first time now I'm going for option two, which is bivariate stats, two variables, all right? And I'm going to put in the weights first, because as I press enter, the, the calculator goes down to the next line. So 70, 75, 77, 85, 90, and 95. Then I go back up and I put in my six heights. 50, 160, 163, 150, 182, and 181. Right. I then go shift stat five for regression and there's three things that I'm interested in here I can get a which is remember we came in when we came in on this mode on the calculator it said a plus bx so a will be the, the sort of y intercept of the graph so I get 70 comma 92 as per the equation on this graph here I now go shift stat five and I go for option two I get one comma 139 and that's the gradient of the graph so what we've got here is we've got a kind of a line of best fit okay and it's just a couple of, of points about it something that's really important is that it goes through the average of the x and y values so just to, to sort of illustrate that to you the actual Data, the, the average of the x values here, the average of all the weights is actually 82. And the average of all the heights happen to be 164, 3. But that wasn't a data item, but the line of best fit always goes through that point. Now, they've never used that so far in an exam, but it is an important fact. And potentially one could get given uh, maybe the gradient as well as the data and asked, or maybe not the data, maybe the gradient and, and the, the average of the data and asked to find the y-intercept. And obviously we know that this point must lie on the curve. So so the, the, there are questions that can be asked. I haven't seen them yet, but I'm sure they're coming, involving the fact that the average x value and the average y value must always lie on the line of best fit. Right, the next, the next uh, important little piece, if we just go back to our calculator, you'll see that there's an, a third option there and that is to that is to calculate sorry that is to get the value of r so shift stat 5 3 gives us our correlation coefficient now we've got a correlation coefficient here of 0.764 right which we will tell you now how to how to interpret so if we just hop onto the next page here. The correlation coefficient ranges between one and minus one. A correlation coefficient that is close to one or minus one suggests a strong relationship. So in this, our 0.764 reasonably strong, all right? Uh, we can see a, a sort of 0.8, sort of like that, all right? A correlation of exactly one is exactly a linear relationship. A correlation that is positive indicates a, a direct relationship. In other words, as the one quantity grows, so does the other. But a correlation that is negative suggests that as the one decreases, sorry, as the one grows, the other one decreases. So in other words, the line will slope downhill. We'll have a negative gradient. Right, so our, our relationship between weight and height in the previous slide, reasonably strong positive correlation. As weight increases, generally height increases. Right, so, so it is important that one's got a sort of idea a correlation close to zero suggests no relationship. All right, correlation maybe a little bit bigger than zero, like 0 0.3, a weak positive relationship. 
just to go back to this example now, right? In the DBE paper, you would have seen a question that asked about the effect of removing a data item. So, so a question might be, what if this point was actually removed from the data set? Would the correlation coefficient get, get uh, what, what might happen to it? Well, basically, this is something of an outlier, right? So what would happen is that the correlation, the relationship would actually get stronger by removing this point. So the correlation coefficient would get closer to one, okay? We might be asked, what would happen if we if we removed, uh, say, this point, uh, what would happen to the slope of the line? And so there's a question like that in the DBE paper, which is worth kind of looking at, because obviously if one removes a point, that, that it, the line will tilt uh, either up or down accordingly. Just the last bit about, about lines of best fit, these squares regression lines, is that if one's got a whole lot of data here, you may find that it that it behaves quite on quite a strong correlation over a range. But in fact maybe something quite different happens after that. Right. So if you work outside, if you use your least squares regression line outside of of the data that you were given, that is called extrapolation. And it's quite a risky thing to do because you're using your, your, you're using your line to make predictions beyond the range of the data that was provided. And maybe the pattern and the relationship which existed on the data you were provided doesn't prevail and continue. Making predictions inside the data range is called interpolation and is a far less risky thing to do. So that's an important concept that you understand the difference between interpolation and extrapolation. Right, so it's it's not uh, it's not always very reliable to extrapolate based on your data.